to this is Arnaud. He is um, from Belgium, and for his um, thesis or diploma at the design studies that he did, he created something called mobile board. It's actually, as you can see, a board that is mobile. Um, it helps kids who live in uh, more neglected areas to actually get access to uh, learning, to reading, to math, but also to all kinds of activities that would support their development. It actually works very well. Kids love it. It really does a lot of good work. The thing is that it doesn't earn money. So to be able to travel around the world uh, to make more of mobile boards and to help more kids, you need money. And there was a certain time when Arnaud, who was um, uh, a student, um, when he discovered that actually he does not have that money. So his savings, non-existent. His mom's goodwill, a little bit used up. So he actually realized that he wouldn't be able to continue. So he has this great solution, and he knows that it can do a lot of good, but he does not have the means to continue. And when he realized that, on a day he realized that, looking at the sad state of his bank account, he actually had a meeting uh, with uh, an employee of an international charity organization. The meeting was in a, in a very specific place. It was... a uh, rubbish heap. It was a rubbish heap where kids were actually collecting rubbish to make their living. So um, they met, and a guy from the charity organization said, well, <laughs> there's not much to be said. You see how it looks like. It's, uh, it's hopeless, you know? That's how they live, and all we can do, we can just fix some bits and pieces, but I can't imagine the power that would be able to change this, like to, to really help them in, in a sustainable way. It's, it's really, you know, it's just hopeless. And he left. And Arnaud stayed there, knowing that he would have to stop his program, and also seeing this whole thing and, well, feeling like you can imagine he felt, you know, feeling really, really bad. like. Maybe the world is not the best place <laughs> in the world. <laughs> and that, basically, it kind of doesn't make sense. And maybe it's just better to, you know, back off. And then a kid approached him. It was a boy. He was around 11 or 12. And he said, what are you doing, man? It's 11. Why aren't you working? And our nose, like, you know, well, I see you're new here, said the kid. So let me explain how this works. Do you have a bag? You don't have a bag? Well, find yourself a bag, okay? This is the first thing, right? Well, it's better to find two bags, right? Because you need one for the bottles and the other one for the cans, okay? Then if you collect the bottles, you don't take those. These are heavy, and they don't really pay well for them. So you just take those. And, um, you know, a good idea is actually to, you know, squeeze them a little bit, then you can collect more. Okay, so that's how you do it bottles and cans, two bags, etc. Now, one thing that is very important. So you are in the area that I manage, right? So at the end of the day, we all gather there. And you want to be there at the end of the day, because you are in trouble if you don't go there. Because what we do is we actually divide the stuff that we have collected. You know, some kids are smaller, right? So they are not able... You, you actually are quite big. So I think you can collect more than them. So at the end of the day, we share so that you know, everybody gets the same. So it's, it's fair. And that was a moment when Arno actually understood a thing that I would like to tell you about today. First of all, he understood that the attitude of the kid was exactly what companies would love to see in their managers. So he created a company called Streetwise, where kids like this, who have this kind of attitude, who have a positive focus, who have this proactive creativity, resilience, and a co cooperation spirit, they actually work with companies to show them how to build this kind of teams and how to nurture this kind of attitude towards reality. So Streetwise is a, a, a commercial company, 
all the profit is reinvented into the development of the mobile boards project. So the mobile boards are there, and the streetwise is there. Everything works, right? But this story is about something more. The story is about where is the real division in the world? Because I think we could all agree that the world feels divided. We feel those divisions. And the question is, where are they? Is it between the rich and the poor? Is it between men and women? Is it between white people and the colored people? Is it religion that divides us? Well, I would say these are all important um, areas that make us different or maybe diverse. But this is not the main division point. The main division is between those who feel they can change the world, those who give themselves the self-permission to do something about the reality around them, and those who feel helpless, those who do not feel they can change something, those who actually do not have that superpower. What is that superpower? Well, the superpower is the feeling that I can do something, that I have an influence. It doesn't mean it's a big influence, but I do have it. The way I live, the way I act, the way I behave, does have an influence. And why do I um, tell you <laughs> that I think this division is there? Well, it's not just because I think so, but I have a great honor, uh, like Ralph mentioned, to um, be a country representative for Poland of a, a foundation called Ashoka, an organization called Ashoka. Ashoka is a worldwide network of change makers, so social entrepreneurs, people who really take uh, the reality, they spot a problem and they start to act upon it. And they actually create a big change. So we have some pretty well-known members of Ashoka, like Jimmy Wells, who redefined access to knowledge through Wikipedia. He's the founder of Wikipedia. Or like Carlo Petrini, who actually changed or changes our attitude towards food through slow food. We probably all know that idea. So these are people that we know, right? And you know what? I've met many of them. I have met two Peace Nobel Prize winners, Muhammad Yunus and Kailash Satyarti, who are also members of the Ashoka Network. And there is nothing special about them. They're just like you and me. Nothing. They don't have the lasers in their eyes, and they don't even have the, you know, the stuff. Nothing. So they, they just decided they're going to do that. They said, no, I don't agree. Well, why does it matter? And why does it matter to realize that this division is there? Well, it matters because if we don't do something with it, people who feel helpless, people who don't have hope and who don't act, they actually will be taken by those who have their ideas. They, will be, they, they are a perfect prey for populists. They are wonderful followers. They are people who are looking for someone to give them an easy answer, an answer that is quite often the wrong one. But who cares? It's an answer. So if we don't want to see violence, if we don't want to see an angry, divided world, we really want to support people because, as you know, this is actually uh, Botticelli's uh, map of hell based on Dante, Dante Alighieri's Inferno, right? So you remember what Dante Alighieri said, that the deepest and the darkest place in hell is booked for the indifferent, for those who didn't do anything. Well, we don't want to get there, right? So what we would like to, to do and what I would like to ask you for is actually to because I'm sure that the TEDx audience is probably the audience of change makers. I'm sure that you do give yourself the self-permission to act. I'm sure that you do change the world around you. But what is important is that it's not enough. We have to empower others to make them feel that power as well. This is super important. Think of the women that Wojtek showed 
they need to feel empowered. Yes, first they need to eat. They need to know that they can take care of their children. But then we really have to make them feel that they can have influence on their life and on that of their kids. Otherwise, they will be angry. So how can we do that on our everyday basis? Well, there are lots of ideas. There is this beautiful book called 31 Ways to Change the World. Well, you can smile, play football, or you can teach your granny to text. There are lots of small things that you can do. I actually really encourage you to have a look at this beautiful publication. You can also look for involvement in lots of causes and NGOs. You can also just change the things you do every day. One of the uh, things that I started to do, and I, I love it actually, is I, I ask the baristas who prepare my coffee for the last book they've read. It's, you can't imagine. <laughs> it's a new world, you know? The stuff that you learn from those people. It's incredible. And I think it makes them feel better. Like, you know, they are not just a, a person that gives me coffee. They are someone that I see, that I get into interaction with. And um, the reason why this is important, well, first of all, is because being a change maker is a wonderful way to be and to make use of this limited time that we have here. But also because it is better to give yourself the self-permission than to ask for permission. It is better to do than to have it done to you or even to have it done for you. And rather than asking for permission, it's better to act, to behave. You probably know those top five regrets of people, who die, the dying people. So the, 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 the most important regret is the things they haven't done. So it's better to do it and then ask for forgiveness than not do it. Thank you. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Do it again. <laughs> what was I going to... I forgot what I was going to ask. You know, there was, I, I had this lovely segue. You know, all, all, all sorted out. Oh, yes. Um, there's, a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a funny talk by Seth Godin, which you may have seen, um, in which he gets pissed off. And he talks about how, how, how he got pissed off, and, 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 and he explains that you know, if you see something broken, it's broken. Why is it broken? Because I say it's broken. This is the kind of attitude that, that you, we want, right? It's like you see something broken, you, you don't go, oh. You go, oh, well, it's so broken that it needs fixing. Well, yes, that's, um, you know, there is always a part of a TED talk that you don't say because uh, you forget to say it. <laughs> so, uh, thank you. <laughs> um, so, um, yes, of course, uh, sometimes uh, what you need to start acting is to follow your anger. You know, you just, there are lots of things that we dislike in the world, but we usually say, oh, what can I do? It's been always like this, you know, I'm just this little something in a huge system. Without, if we continue doing that, and if we all do that, then the things won't be, the broken things won't be fixed. So one of the things is when you see a broken thing or a thing that doesn't work and it makes you angry, actually follow your anger in a constructive way. That's a, that's a beautiful beginning of becoming a change maker. And I think we can leave it there. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>